Good to see you, Venture Christian Church. Those of you who are in the room, I'm so grateful to see you. You braved the weather today. I'm so glad to see you. And those of you who are joining us from home, I'm glad that you're with us today as well. You should know that uh, I am a bit of a sucker for wartime movies. I don't know about you, but when, when I was a kid, um, Saturday afternoon, maybe Sunday afternoon, there were these black and white films that uh, would show up on the screen. And every once in a while, these would distract me even from, you know, clicking over, actually, who are we kidding? It wasn't this when I was a kid, it was this. Maybe I was heading to a ball game and I'd see one of these on that channel that the TV came on, on and, and I would stick there. There was a particular song, and I'm too young to really know the context of this song. Maybe some of you, you know where this comes from, because I think it was a real song. And I remember it in at least one of these wartime mo movies from like World War II. And it was a bunch of men in a baritone voice like chorus singing this song. And yes, I'm going to sing it. Over there, over there, and then they would do this, like this, the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, we won't come back till it's, and they would like chant it over, over there. And I would listen to that and it would like stir my little heart. I don't know, there's something about a wartime movie that captures my attention. We don't watch broadcast TV anymore. We have Netflix for this, right? And even now, Netflix, if I see a Braveheart or Lord of the Rings come through on that scroll, The Patriot, oh my goodness, it sucks me in. I love a good wartime movie and a battle scene. Speaking of Netflix, I've kind of been captured by a binge watching uh, thing. You probably have too. I've been reading the statistics about during the pandemic. You've been binge watching way too much Netflix. I know this. How many of you have seen The Crown? Has anybody been tracking with this? Some of you at home as well. All right, The Crown. If you haven't seen this, I haven't seen all of it, but what I've seen has me intrigued. It's the story of the House of Windsor. This is uh, the, 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 uh, the crown, if you will, from England, merry old England. You've got the queen herself. You've got Lady Diana, Princess Di. And then you've got the prime minister. Here, this is Margaret Thatcher. But when this series begins, at the very beginning of it, the prime minister is Winston Churchill. You know, that guy with the powerful voice, wartime England. He smoked those giant cigars. I think they called them Churchills, right? And uh, what's so interesting to me about this show, again, I haven't watched all of it, but I've watched some, and then I've gotten on this kind of side track, watched a bunch of, um, what do you call them, um, documentaries surrounding this story as well. It's the interplay between how the prime minister, and the prime minister refers to the queen as the crown, so how the prime minister and the crown, she calls her the sovereign, how they interact. We're at war. Spiritually speaking, we're in a spiritual battle. What I want to wrestle with today is how the prime minister of your life, that's you, by the way, you're the leader of your own life, how the prime minister of your life interacts with your sovereign. Welcome to week six. This is the final message of this series. We're calling it Wartime Courage. This wraps up our series uh, from 2 Corinthians called Encouraged. We're seeking to put some courage back into one another. And today, we're going to see how Paul, well, how he encourages the troops. So if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to go there here in just a minute. By the way, as you're doing that, as you're going there, even at home, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I just want to say how much I've enjoyed this particular series. We're seeking to put courage into each other. I appreciated John's message last week. I mentioned last week as I introduced him that this series, well, it was his idea. And I've sure appreciated it. And I'm actually looking forward to the next several weeks as well. I want to give you just a sneak peek of what you've got to look forward to. Next weekend, next weekend, fellas, listen up, heads up. Next Sunday is the 14th of February, which happens to be Valentine's Day. Don't say nobody didn't warn you. So you've got about a week to gear up. I don't know if your wife will count this or not, but coming to church next week could actually count as a date because we're pulling out all the stops. 
we're planning for this. We're going to get into a special weekend surrounding love and all things related. We're going to have a photo booth set up in the lobby so you can take pictures with you and your loved ones. We're going to send you out with a special cookie, a treat to commemorate the day. And we've got some programming wrapped around this idea of love. So some of you at home, maybe you've been dancing with the idea, well, we're feeling like it's about time to start coming back to church. Can I say next weekend would be a brilliant time to aim at. I hope you plan to join us if you're at all able. Then the following weekend, we're going to be launching a year-long, what I'm calling a pop-up series. Because different weeks during the year, we're going to have kind of pop-up messages. We're calling it Where in the World. Here's why. We're a church that values God's global heart. And so we want to come to you from on location through the year, a series of times during this pop-up series, Where in the World. I'm not going to tell you where I'm going to be preaching from that particular weekend. You're going to have to come to church and figure out yourself, but it won't be from here. Then the next week, we're going to launch a series that's called Enough. And we're going to be aiming at that sweet spot between fear and faith. And we're going to be asking the question, is Jesus enough to cover over my you fill in the blank? And each one of those blanks, we're going to be wrestling with that during those weeks, all the way up to Easter weekend. That series will culminate Easter weekend. And I hope right now you start thinking about who can you invest in and who can you invite to come and join you, whether it's online or here in the room for Easter this year? It's going to be great. Then the weekend after Easter, we're kicking off a new series, and you're going to want to make sure your friend that you invest in and you invite to join you for church on Easter, that they're going to come back that next weekend because we're kicking off a super practical series that weekend about healthy households. And we're going to be investing in you like parents, We're bringing in a nationally recognized speaker to preach that weekend, and then they're going to be doing a parenting workshop that day. You're going to want to sign up for that. It's going to be real practical help in how to do what God has called you to do and to do it even better. We're going to be doing a weekend where we're investing in our marriages and trying to make good marriages better. Stay tuned for all of that. I'm excited about that series, but I get ahead of myself. I'm excited about today, wrapping up this series, Encouraged. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you've got your Bible open now, let's start with verse 1. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. Again, this is in letter form. Picture a bunch of Corinthian first century believers reading this letter together all in one space. I, Paul, by the way, What's he doing here? We talked about this, if you remember, the very first week of this series. Paul is writing this letter, co-writing it with one of his protégés, Timothy. Well, here in this section, he's kind of peeling back and he's saying, listen, this one comes directly from me. Perhaps you remember another letter that he wrote where he said, I, Paul, am writing this section in my own hand. That's kind of what's happening right here. He's, because he's getting autobiographical. He says, I, Paul, who am, quote, timid, When face to face with you, but bold when I am away. What's happening there? Well, he's quoting what some people have leveled as accusations against him. Probably the same people are in the audience right now, and they're listening to this letter being read out loud. And he's responding to them, to these accusations. I beg you that when I come, I may not... By the way, what he's doing here is he's, he's casting vision. He's doing what I just did a second ago. As a leader, he's saying, here's what's coming up over the next few months. I'm going to come and visit you. And I'm excited about that. And I can't wait to unpack some more what God is doing in our lives together. When I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Some of you, he's saying, you're not living up to the purpose that God called you to this side of heaven's door. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. And I just bet there was a young boy who was listening to this, maybe pre-teenage like I was watching those wartime movies when I'd sit up a little bit on the couch. He hears the word war and waging war, and I bet he sat up a little bit and listened in just a little bit more attentively. Then he says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. The world is fighting. 
We don't fight the same way. On the contrary, they have divine power, these weapons that God has given us to wage war, divine power to demolish strongholds. And then he teases that out a little bit further, and he says, we demolish arguments, same word, demolish. And every pretension lies from the devil himself that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. There is so much there to unpack, these five short verses. So for the rest of the time that we have together today, I want to grab four what I'm going to call battle challenges straight from those verses. And if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, write these down. Seek to walk these into your life because you are at war right now. Here's the first battle challenge. You're at war, but not necessarily with who you're fighting. We have to recognize that we are at war. It's a spiritual battle. Battle lines seem obvious, but I wonder if we pick a fight sometimes with the wrong enemies. I told you I've been binge watching Netflix. I've been watching The Crown and all the documentaries that surround that. One of those documentaries that I watched talks about what was happening during World War II at the same time that that dynasty, the queen and the king, come to power. As Hitler's appetite for power and territory grew, the same time that Winston Churchill was the prime minister in England, Hitler was uh, taking his armies and marching across Europe. In some cases, the fight could hardly be called a battle. The German army advanced with its tanks and with technologically advanced weapons. They had a war machine. In some of the underdeveloped nations that surrounded Germany, though, well, their armies made a futile effort to resist Hitler, Hitler's aggression. And they were fighting back, get this, with spears and even with rocks. It was no contest at all because these nations, get this, they were not equipped for battle. We don't want to live that way not spiritually speaking, because the same could be said of Satan and those whom he opposes. Y'all, we're even fighting on the wrong front, with the wrong weapons sometimes. So consequently, many of Satan's victims do not even know that there's a war going on. They're fighting on the wrong front. They make easy prey, and Christians should know that we're in the midst of a great spiritual struggle, although it may not even seem to believe it. And even more distressing is the fact that many who consider themselves in the war, well, they don't even understand the nature of Satan's schemes, of the weapons that he deploys, or of the weapons that God has provided for our defense. So we're going to talk about those, but first, write this down. We're at war, but we get caught up in the wrong skirmishes. This happened for the Corinthians. Just two verses after what we just read, in verse 7 of chapter 10, he says this, you're looking only on the surface of things. He's saying there's a war that's brewing, but you're looking up here, it's happening elsewhere. He takes this, this same idea and he teases it out in another letter that he wrote, this time to the church in Ephesus. And if you want to go there with me, I'm in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, when he says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not on the surface of things, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We get distracted by the skirmishes on the wrong battlefront. Today in our culture, today actually, literally today, we kind of go to battle, right? This is Super Bowl Sunday. So today we paint our faces, we choose sides, we pick a team. And think about the teams even this year. You've got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you've got the Kansas City Chiefs. Listen, these are warrior memes, right? Warrior culture, they represent war. Speaking of memes, I've got a friend who every year this time sends me this silly meme. Maybe you've seen it. You should be as excited about church as about the Super Bowl. So when your pastor makes a point this Sunday, pour Gatorade over his head. By the way, second service, I don't want any of my tech team thinking that that's funny. Every time I see that, I kind of giggle a little bit. And can I just be honest with you? That moment at the end of the Super Bowl, it happens every year. It gets doused. I, I always think... Oh, man, the poor guy, he's got to receive the Lombardi Trophy. There's a press conference. He's got to do the, the locker room speech. Afterwards, he's going to be sticky for the rest of the night. I feel bad for him. And then I think, yeah, but he just won the Super Bowl. He'll be, he'll be just fine. Seriously, though, when I think about the sideways energy that goes into the passion that we display for our favorite sports teams, we get caught up sometimes in the wrong skirmishes. Let me spin that meme on its side. Do you get at least as excited about eternal things 
as you do about your team making the playoffs? Do you lose at least as much sleep at night worrying about your neighbor or your friend who's far from God? Are you already thinking about praying for the person that you're going to invest in and you're going to invite to come and join you for Easter? Do you spend at least as much energy praying for their soul, their eternal destiny, as you do about your favorite team winning the game? We get caught up in the wrong skirmishes. Politics. Do you feel as much angst about the war over sin in your own life as you feel against the leader of the political party that you're so angry with, that you have angst with today? Which brings us to our second battle challenge. We're on a battlefield, but not necessarily where you're fighting. I mean, the field of battle seems obvious. It would have for the Corinthians when they received this letter. Have you ever heard of the Corinthian War? They had. It was a pretty famous battle between the Greek city-states. They knew all about battlefields, and they had since they were little kids. But Paul drops a truth on them in this letter by saying this. Your primary battlefield, it's in your mind. Satan wants to play mind games with you. That's what he's saying to the Corinthians, and by extension, that's what he's saying to us as well. He wants to play mind games with you, but remember, he's the tempter. He's the deceiver. He's the father of lies. He messes with you, but much of the time, what he's messing you with, it's a lie. It's not even true. Lies like this one. I bet somebody has had this whispered in their ear or maybe shouted in their ear by the devil himself recently. Something like this. God doesn't want to hear from you anymore. Not after you've ignored him for so long. That's a lie. Here's the truth. God wants, desperately wants to hear from you. Even if, maybe especially if it's been a while. Don't buy into that lie from Satan. Here's a lie, maybe you've heard this one, that the world is too wicked and it's too scary for you to ever find happiness or peace. No, that's a lie straight from hell. Here's the truth. Fear sure seems to be one of Satan's favorite tools these days. But don't give in to that nonsense. Even when things are hard, maybe especially when they're really hard, God's plan provides hope and joy for you. Here's a lie. You've tried and you tried, but you're just not good enough. You're never going to make it home to God. That's a lie that he whispers so the devil does into your ear. Here's the truth. That's the zinger of all lies. If the adversary can convince you that you'll never be good enough, he scores a major victory. Don't let him plant this thought into your brain because Jesus' blood covers your sin. You always have a path back to God. Here's the truth. Satan has less power than you give him credit for. Remember what we just read, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What does that word demolish mean? Well, we should learn it because he uses it twice here. We're getting ready to see it again. It literally means to stomp out, to stamp out, cannot stand up against at all. You have divine power to demolish strongholds. Hear me. Here's the truth. Satan has lost all of his power in Jesus Christ, yet he deceives us who are in Christ into believing that we have no power over him. So, in order to win the war, we must take control of our thought life. This is the message that Paul is sending to that Corinthian church, and by extension, he's sending it to us today as well. Let's look at that verse again. We demolish, there's our word again, stomp it out. We demolish arguments coming from Satan, and every pretension, a lie directly from the pit of hell, that sets itself up against the knowledge of who we know God to be, and we take captive. Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The question is, how do we do that? How do we take thoughts captive? Well, I want to share real quick with you six of these. These aren't mine. These come straight from a Christian pastor and a Christian clinical psychologist. His name is Richard Gantz. You might want to write these down. Number one, accept responsibility for your thoughts. 
You have the ability to exercise control over your thoughts. God warned, perhaps you remember if you're a Bible student in the Old Testament, God warned Cain to focus his mind on the right things. But Cain chose to think about the wrong things, anger and jealousy, which led to his murderous actions. Remember, Cain killed his brother Abel. Here's the question. Are you willing to admit that you can, with God's help, regain control of your thoughts and think enabling thoughts instead of disabling ones? Here's the second challenge. Your mind, not just your behavior, must change. God calls us to change sinful behavior that does not honor him. Instead of focusing on your outward behavior at work, instead on disciplining your mind from which behavior stems. Allow God to transform you by the renewing of your mind. We pull that straight from Scripture. Romans 12, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here's the third one. Think through your problems rather than just react to them. When you experience difficult challenges, you can react to them, and you can think yourself into despair when you do that every single stinking time. Or you can look forward to the next opportunity to ask yourself what you learned from this failure this past week. I was doing a routine task, letting the dog out in the morning. Somehow, in the process, I cut my finger. That spot on the end of your thumb that's just like way too silly, sensitive, and all day I was babying it. Those of you who type, every time I hit the space bar with that thumb, my thumb hurt. And I whined a little bit inside my head. I dealt with it all day long. I discovered I wasn't even picking things up. I was babying my hand. And then it dawned on me. I'm about 30 yards Maybe, maybe not even that, from our workroom, and there are Band-Aids in the cabinet in there, and I went in and put on a Band-Aid and covered over that sensitive place in the skin, and I was just fine. It, was, it had kind of been a death by a thousand cuts because it kept bothering me because I didn't deal with it. Is your first thought, listen, I'll never do anything right. You don't have to get caught into disabling thoughts. You're capable of getting out of your shame and your despair and your hopelessness and your anger by taking control of your thoughts. Do something about it. Number four, take your disabling thoughts captive through confession. Take every thought captive in Christ Jesus. We're going to celebrate communion here in just a few minutes. Perhaps that's something to exercise then. Number five, choose to focus your thoughts on the right things. So replace those negative things, those bad things, with good things. Paul talks about this in another letter, this time to the, 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 the group of believers in Philippi. In chapter 4 of Philippians, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, this is what you're supposed to be thinking about. When we think about those things, God promises to give us peace. What a contrast that is to the thoughts of millions of people today. Don't look at a movie or a TV show or a how-to formula to accomplish this for you. It takes personal discipline, and it takes commitment. So right now, could I challenge you to do a little bit of calendar work? Right now, what are you planning to do this week? And you know it's the wrong thing. It's going to fill your mind with the wrong things. Take it off your calendar. Or maybe there are things that should be on your calendar and you have not purposed them. You have not pre-planned your calendar for that. Put those on your calendar right now, whatever is lovely. Because here's the thing. It's possible. It's possible. You can develop a new frame of reference based on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. All right. So far, we've discovered uh, the battle challenges, uh, that you are at war, but not necessarily with who you're fighting. You're on a battlefield, but not necessarily where you're fighting. Write this one down. Choose your weapons, but not necessarily what you have been using. Weapons of war oftentimes seem obvious to us. At least they do to me. They probably did to the Corinthians. This is probably what they pictured when they read the verses we just read. By the way, in the first century, it appears that everybody kind of was a cartoon character. I'm kidding. That's a horrible dad joke. There's no photographs that extend from the first century to now, and so we're kind of left with a cartoon picture of what it might have looked like. But this is what they would have pictured, a Roman soldier who would have been positioned and, and, and in Corinth of the day. And these are the weapons of war that were at their disposal. This is what would have seemed obvious to them. What about us? Well, I don't know about you, but I constantly wrestle 
uh, with choosing the wrong weapons. Maybe it's weapons of war that I want to grab at, like the Corinthians probably were tempted to think of. I told you, there are way too many shows on Netflix to binge watch right now. It's the middle of the pandemic. This is what we've been doing. By the way, here's an image that I saw this past week. This is a tweet. Last year, Americans cumulatively streamed more than 57 billion, that's with a B, minutes of The Office. Billion, 57 billion minutes. That's amazing. How many of you have seen that new show? I haven't watched it yet, but I hear it's pretty good. I think it's called Cobra Kai. It's the latest thing in the Karate Kid. How many of you, is it good? Is it worth putting on my list? I hope so, because as a kid that grew up in the 80s, there were more than once my mom and dad walked into my bedroom and caught me doing that because I loved that movie. Those of you who know that, you know that's the crane kick. And the, the, the fight that happens in that first movie against the Cobra Kai do- dojo, they had this mantra, this chant, uh, and it went something like this, strike first, strike hard, no mercy, sir. If that's not a battle cry from our culture, if that's not the mantra of the playground that I grew up on, the temptation to lean into that power over strategy of choosing your weapons, yeah, I don't know what is. Paul takes that imagery of the war imagery and he flips it on its head. He does this in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Not what you're picturing, but it looks something like this. As we read through this, choose your weapons wisely. So that when the day of evil comes, not if, but when it comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Count the number of times he says that. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, so plant your feet, let's get into the fight, with the belt of truth. Here's a weapon buckled around your waist. What else do we have at our disposal? With the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil ones. What else do we have? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the saints. Here they are. Here are your weapons at your disposal. Steadfastness, we're called to stand firm. And then we've got truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of, the, of God, the very word of God, the Bible that we study, and prayer itself. Now, I want to do a gear check. I've never stood a post. I've never been a soldier taking up arms on behalf of my country. But I am a gear guy. My wife will tell you that. I've got way too many toys. We took our kids skiing this past weekend. And uh, the last time I went skiing, a few months ago, I had just hit the slopes and my snowboard bindings blew out. Why? Because I didn't do an appropriate gear check. We love to go rock climbing, and I've got some of that gear. Listen, Usually before, no, every time you climb onto the wall, you check the rope, you check the gear. Why? Because your very life is hanging in the balance. We're in a spiritual war. It's probably wise with the time that we've got left today. Let's do a gear check. Check in. Honestly assess how are you doing with the weapons of war that are at your disposal. Are you steadfast? Are you standing firm? Are you even in the fight? Or have you resigned? Have you already thrown in the white flag of surrender? Hear me. Don't give up. Gear up. Here's one. The belt of truth. What is this? This is your integrity. Listen, a soldier in Paul's day had a leather girdle or a belt that tightened around his waist to protect his loins. This is a big deal. This is integrity. Let me ask the question. Would people say that you're a woman or a man of integrity? If not, you cannot win the battle. How's your integrity today? You've got the breastplate of righteousness. This this is your purity. The breastplate of a soldier was oftentimes made of woven chain, and it was used to cover the soldier's vital organs. For the Christian, the breastplate, it's righteousness. And the enemy wants to attack you not only with lies, but also with impurity. He wants you to explore filthy websites. He wants you to watch immoral movies. And he wants you to engage in all kinds of temptations of the flesh. The bottom line is that Satan wants to get at your heart and your mind, and he's looking for a crack in your armor. So don't be fooled. Satan knows where the weak spaces are. Is your heart pure before God today? If not, you cannot win the battle. You've got the shoes of peace. This represents your tranquility. 
A Roman soldier would have had hobnails probably in the soles of their shoes, kind of like football cleats. Because when you're fighting, you need solid footing so that you can stand your ground. Unless you have solid footing and you've got this peace that he talks about, you can never make war. Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Well, when Satan comes against your tranquility, he throws out stones of doubt and discouragement to cause you to stumble. Do you have peace right now? If not, you can't win the battle. There's the shield of faith. This is your certainty. A Roman soldier's shield measured approximately two by four feet, and it was made of wood, and it was covered with leather. And in that day, soldiers dipped arrows in oil, lit them on fire, and shot them at you, at the enemy. These shields were vital to protect the soldiers from getting burned. Satan is going to fire flaming arrows of doubt at you. He wants to place subtle doubts in your mind about God and his truth. He knows a spark can ignite a big fire. We well, need to feed your faith and starve your doubts. Let me say that again. You need to feed your faith and starve your doubts. Are there any seeds of doubt in your mind today? If there are, you cannot win the battle. There's the helmet of salvation. This is your sanity. A soldier used a helmet to protect his head, right? Because the head needs to be in the right place. Do you know, do you have assurance of salvation? Do you know that you're saved? If you aren't, then you cannot win the battle. If you're online today and you're like, I don't know if I've got that assurance. Let one of our online hosts know they would love nothing more than to pray with you and encourage you and walk you through that process. If you're in the room today and you want that kind of assurance, you don't want Satan to mess with your head I'd love to meet you after the service. I'll be hanging out over here. I would love nothing more than to encourage you and to walk you through that. That leaves the sword of the Spirit and prayer. These are your lifelines. And I want to give you today some real practical application, an application step you can take here in the form of an opportunity. Are you studying your Bible right now? Are you in the Word? Are you praying without ceasing? If you aren't, you cannot win the battle. So I want to help you gear up with these very specific weapons. You saw the announcement that Robin shared just a bit ago about soap studies. I want to show you a picture. These are my soap study tools, the weapons of war that I take into the battle. I've done a soap study for years. I love this form of studying God's Word and getting into fellowship and community with other believers. I look forward to jumping into this myself. I'm so excited that Venture is going to be doing this moving forward. And um, it's pretty cool. Soap is a pretty simple uh, acrostic. Here it is on the screen. And it stands for kind of the flow of what you can expect to have happen. If you join one of these groups, whether it's virtual, online, or here in person, and we're going to have opportunities like in the mornings and in the evenings, and there'll be opportunities for men-specific and women-specific. There'll be opportunities for couples as well. You can sign up all month long, and then we're going to launch these March 1st, and they're going to go through the end of the calendar year. Listen. I want to talk you into this. You can and should do this. Join a cohort, a soap study. And in that one hour, no homework, you're going to show up each week. And you're going to dive into Scripture first. Usually we read the, tw the text twice together and we kind of absorb it together. We absorb what we're reading, Scripture. And then there's an observation period. And this was one of my favorite spaces in this moment. Because... When people gather together, you bring your life experiences and you bring your observations. And I'll never forget a moment studying through the book of Acts. And one of the guys in my soap study, his name is Tracy. He's an infectious disease doc. And we get to that space in Acts 28 where um, Paul is wrecked on the Isle of Malta and the governor's father is sick and maybe dying. And we read through the symptoms and Tracy piped up and said, I think he might have Shigella. And we all stopped and we looked at him because he brings his expertise to the text. We had teachers in that group that would point out literary things and, and an author, actually, that would point out the literary structure of the words. And we'd all kind of go, man, that's brilliant. Business guys who would see, like, business principles that would just leap out of the text to them. And I would sit there as a pastor and I would just think, man, this is feeding me right now. The observation period is pretty cool. Then, very important, you go to application. We don't, we're not just hearers of the word, but we're also doers of the word as well. So how do we take this and apply it to Friday morning? We met on Thursday morning, 7 a.m. every week. How does this change my Friday? And then we would spend time praying for each other, encouraging one another, doing life together. Guys, this is easy. 
sign up for one of these. Uh, it's uh, an opportunity straight in front of you, and some of the benefits are there's no homework, it's convenient, it's community built in, it's timely, this is very COVID friendly. Like I said, we're onboarding right now. Here's how you can sign up. If you go to venturechristian.church slash forms, you can sign up to be one of, in one of these right now or sign up just for more information. And David Smith, our discipleship pastor, will talk you into doing this. Uh, we're going to send you emails this week. We'll buy, you'll be able to know how to sign up for this. I would challenge you, do this. You'll be very glad you did. It's going to be awesome. I want to send you out of here today. We're going to continue in worship we're going to respond to what we've just studied together here in a moment online. We're going to sing. Here in the room, we're going to sing. We're going to worship. Right now, could I invite you to simply stand up with me? Because I want to leave you with our fourth wartime challenge. And it's real simple. Fight to win. We are in a spiritual war. Listen, at the beginning, I told you that I wanted to explore together with you how the prime minister of your life, that's you, and your sovereign, how you interact. We talked about Winston Churchill briefly. He was a wartime leader. And I want you to listen to the passion from one of his powerful wartime speeches. He spoke this to the House of Commons, June 4th, 1940. Just listen to this, none shall pass declaration. We ain't retreating is what he's saying, and he says it more eloquently than that. He says, fight to win. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag nor fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and with strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We will never surrender. We will never surrender. Paul puts it more succinctly. We ain't giving up. Paul says it this way, finally. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We can go ahead and put that on the screen. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Take your stand. Pick up a weapon. Fight to win. Never surrender. I don't know what you're facing this week, but God does. God does. He's already in front of it, and he's already given you good weapons to take to the fight. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to stand and then stand firm. And then after everything else, to stand some more, to pick up the weapons that you've got, you've given us for our disposal to live our lives well for you. So, Lord, as we respond now by worshiping you, Lord, let this sink in. As we begin to think about what you've called us to this next week, let's put this into practice. Give us your wisdom. Give us your courage as we step into that space. It's in your name and Jesus' name we pray. Amen.